You're tuned in to the Soulful Conversations podcast, featuring a panel of life coaches and spiritual leaders from around the world, discussing how to handle some of life's greatest challenges. We will be sharing stories of courage, hope, and inspiration with you, our faithful listeners, to live your happiest and most fulfilling life full of purpose and passion for yourself, your families, and the world. We are here to be the change we wish to see. Let the conversation begin. And welcome to the, our eighth episode of the Soulful Conversations. Today, we are going to be talking about mindset and mental health. Um, I am super excited to start this conversation with our amazing guest today. So as we normally do, I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves, and then I'm going to start off the conversation. So Sue, let's start with you, and then whoever wants to pop in, introduce yourself. So my name is Sue Mitchell Metz. Um, I am a nurse in uh, work in EMS by background. However, I've become dedicated, um, a dedicated advocate for mental health and suicide awareness um, and wanting to help those who've lost a loved one to suicide and suffer with suicidal ideation, mental health, and or if they are in a crisis. Um, and I do this because almost five years ago, my oldest son, Ryan, he was 30 years old at the time, um, he died by suicide. Um, at that time, I decided to go back to school, already having um, a bachelor's degree in nursing and a master's degree in organizational leadership. I um, wanted to learn more about, you know, suicide, mental health, etc. But I chose to get a master's degree in thanatology, which is a study of death, dying, grief, and bereavement. Um, and I just, when I was doing that course, I um, actually um, specialized in like child loss and um, suicide loss. So I could just get a better understanding of both sides, um, those who were suicidal and those who were grieving the loss of someone. So I thought they went pretty well together. Um, I am married to my husband, Steve. I have three adult children, Ryan. As I said, he passed almost five years ago, Mariah and Bryden. And Ryan left a beautiful um, granddaughter for me. Um, her name is Diane. She just turned 12. Um, and I enjoy when I'm not volunteering or working, I enjoy camping uh, with my husband and friends. Um, I am employed full time with uh, organization, uh, healthcare organization, and I probably volunteer in the community for mental health and suicide awareness as many hours as I work. Oh, well, thank you for joining us. You're a wealth of information. Roger, you wanna go next? Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Dr. Roger McPhillan. I'm a clinical psychologist. I am executive director at the Center for Integrated Behavioral Health, which is in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And I specialize in the treatment of post-traumatic stress conditions, people who are uh, chronically suicidal and struggling with mood as well as eating disorders. I am also the co-host of the Radically Genuine podcast and have been an outspoken uh, critic of the uh, psychiatric diagnostic system and many of the harms that are created by typical treatments, uh, psychiatric drugs in particular. And, and uh, my mission really now is to help educate people on what it does take to overcome the challenges of, of living and, and what science does say about what is safe and uh, what is most effective and being able to work with people who are struggling. Mm, well, thank you for your voice and thank you for your passion that you put behind what you're, you're doing in the world. Portia. Hello, hello, everybody. Portia Booker is back. I am the host and executive producer of Grew Up Portia Talk radio show and podcast. This subject is very near and dear to my heart as I am someone who has survived suicide twice and have dedicated my life to helping other people to come forward about their mental health journey and to really promote healing through living, finding a purpose. So I'm honored to be here. Thank you, Portia. Steph? Hello. Um, you know, it's hard to speak after all such a great panelists that we have today. I'm so excited. And just as portion Sue, this uh, mental health and mindset is very close and near and dear to my heart as well, because I've also lost my son to suicide. And I think that mental health needs to be taken more seriously. And I think that conversations like this can help open up the doors. So I'm so excited. And thank you all very much for being here with us today. Yes, thank you. 
Well, I found Roger on social media. I, I don't remember how or when or why, but um, I looked through some of his posts. I love all of his posts, but this one in particular, I thought was blended itself very well to start this conversation. He wrote, millions still believe psychiatric drugs correct a chemical imbalance. They believe they are sick imbalanced, disordered, different, need to be cured. This in itself will keep them depressed. And that is so powerful to me because when you go seeking help for something and somebody tells you you have a disorder, now you start believing that there's something wrong with you instead of I'm having a human experience, I'm experiencing you know, emotions, I'm experiencing grief, I'm experiencing loss. So um, Portia, I'm gonna start with you. Um, talk about something when you are going through like a hard time where you just don't feel like, oh, you know, life is just too hard. I'm in a dark place. I'm in a sad place. What, how do you get yourself out of it? What are the things that help pull you into a different mindset? Well, I want to start first by coming back to what you just mentioned about certain medications. I can tell you from my personal journey in 2017, when I was heavily plagued by depression, we didn't look at all the parallels going on in my life. I just relocated to a brand new city, brand new state, took on a brand new job, right? And there's grief that comes with that. Did I make the right decision to relocate? Did I make the right decision to leave my family? Where's my support system? So all of those emotions that are sitting on my head, it's too much to bear at times. So to go back to what you asked, Dawn, as far as when the days get dark, what's really helped me moving forward and, and recently losing my mom. So now I'm really in a new state of grief with living life or moving forward without my mother, my main squeeze. What's been helping me is one, therapy. I found the right therapist who really mesh well. They say you have to date your therapist. And the one who I have is definitely one that I could date because they meet me where I'm at. They're not so quick to shove, oh, you need this medication to feel safe. You need that medication, you need this. No, the first thing they gave me was a writing assignment and I love writing. So really them forcing me into an element that I was already comfortable with and is my love language, helped me to really open up and really start my healing journey all over again. So being able to identify my emotions instead of continuously suppressing them, I think that that was the issue that I had when I was on several different medications at the time, right? In society's eyes, I was protected, but really the way I describe it is I was a shield, right? A shield with thorns on the inside the shield to protect the rest of the world from my angry outbursts, from my depressive episodes, from my suicidal ideations, from my suicidal thoughts. But on the inside, I was not healed. I was still a detriment and damage to myself. So to go back to what you said, Dawn, what has really helped me on the dark days is one, writing, two, support system. You got to have that support system is the nucleus to really keep you afloat when you're having those thoughts. And I can tell you from personal experience, even with my coaches, I've had to learn to let down that wall of shame and guilt to reach out to them and say, hey, I'm struggling. Can you, can you talk for five minutes, even if it's through text? So again, writing, support system, and a therapist who meets you where your level has been my saving grace to get me through the dark days. Oh, that's that's a powerful Portia. Roger, you since you do this and you see people all the time, talk about how you help people with these when they come to you like this. Sure. When I constructed that tweet, I wanted it to be a bit multifactorial. I wanted it to be complex. So I, I was hoping that people would see it from multiple perspectives. One, we're in a unique time in in culture. And I think in a lot of ways our culture is is sick that we are, we're becoming more distressed. So everything that, that you see statistically is we have higher rates of, of suicide, we have higher rates of depression, anxiety, death by despair, including substance abuse. And I think it's important that we also look at our greater culture and what influences uh, the struggles that we do have. So when I talked about that chemical imbalance idea, I, I think there's probably close to 80 to 90% 
of people in the United States who, who still believe that if you're struggling emotionally, it has something to do with a, a deficiency in specific brain chemicals. You know, this is clearly debunked by, by science. And uh, there's even been recent papers out there, especially when it comes to depression that clearly state, listen, hey, this has nothing to do with serotonin. But yet the number one treatment for anyone who's struggling emotionally with depression is to target brain chemicals with a psychoactive substance that has significant side effects and withdrawal effects and uh, has a black box warning on it for uh, increased rates of, of suicide. But I think what's most important is if you begin to think about your struggle, the emotions that you're feeling outside of the greater context, like Portia discussed all the different things that were going on in her life. Well, it does limit us from being able to face and solve those problems. We begin to think about our own emotions as if they're symptoms of an illness. And that's dangerous because it makes you believe that there is something inherently wrong with you, that something is broken within you. And I think that in itself is a precursor to a greater level of struggle, struggle to see yourself in that way. You know, I, I wish that we would be able to be more connected in being able to talk about how difficult life is and the various ranges of normal. Um, so like the discuss, you're going to go through periods where you're going to feel depressed. You're going to go through loss, tragedy, pain, struggle, anxiety, fear. Collectively, there's nothing more normal than that. So I'm much more interested in how people cope with those situations, supporting people to respond to those situations and allows them to face it, be able to understand it and take the necessary steps to move along in their evolution and their journey. I think Portia did a, a really good job of talking about what that process looks like for her. And I think the things that she discussed around social support and, and community introspection, coping, are probably the primary factors that are going to that are going to help most people. I think other things that we have to be aware of are also the intersection between our physical health and our mental health. And I think that is a that's a piece that's not discussed enough, especially around metabolic health, our connection with nature, exercise, our physical health. It's very difficult to feel well if you're not physically well. And so being able to understand all of the necessary steps to create a life of value purpose and one that's worth living i think that includes becoming one that is much more connected with our, our our physical health i think the third piece is also just spiritual connection or or faith you know the idea that that there's more to this life than just the moments and the pain that we experience. And we've become more detached from that, at least in American society. And I think that those who really uh, do well in life, who respond to uh, tragedy and, and prolonged episodes of, of challenges, they often are able to accept the temporary nature of struggle and pain. And they, they understand that whatever their purpose is, it comes with that pain. And the development of wisdom can come through struggles that are bring you closer to whatever your purpose may be. Woo, I, I have goosebumps all over my body because everything you said was so powerful. And um, I do want to go to Sue, but I did want to touch on something that you said about the, the chemical imbalance. And I don't want to get too into the weeds on that one, but you know, our bodies when we respond to things, our bodies produce different hormones and chemicals. You know, if we're in fight or flight, like there, we'll have an adrenaline rush. So we, we produce our own chemicals according to what's our external stimuli and also the thoughts we think. As we were talking before we, we started recording today, we were all talking about our pets. You know, when you pet your dog or your cat, unless they're being super naughty at the moment, that that like releases, is that serotonin or oxytocin, the bonding hormone? So it makes us feel good. So, I mean, our minds are capable of that by ourselves without external intervention. So I did want to like tap into that because I think that's powerful for us to understand that, you know, our bodies are that powerful. Our minds are that powerful. So yeah, I'm chime okay. in on too, Dawn, you know, because when we become a life coach, the first thing that we learned is to be, to notice what we're noticing in our thoughts. And when we have a thought, which is thousands a day, if you stand on one, it creates a feeling in your body. 
And so if you're thinking, you know, for instance, why is my child not calling? Why is my child not home? Then your next thought may be going to, did they have an accident? Did something bad happen? You know, what we focus on, we really do bring energy to. And so we can take that thought and let it pass on through, or we can take it, you know, and then again, like I said, it's going to cause a feeling in your body. Absolutely. Sue, I know you've got, you've got much to add on to this. Yeah. So um, I think, you know, what I want to add is my personal experience um, with um, the, the stigma, I guess, of mental illness. And um, as I worked through the death of my son and trying to find healthy ways to cope, um, I was diagnosed with, you know, different mental illnesses. Um, I was told I had severe depression. I had severe and even crippling anxiety um, with anxiety and panic attacks I was having and even PTSD because um, all I could focus on and um, Stephanie just touched on it too, was even though I did not find my son, I had a picture in my mind how he was found and what they saw. And I could not get that out of my head and I could not stop focusing on that. Um, and so, you know, I, they, they told me that, you know, I was affected or, or I'm sorry, they diagnosed me with the PTSD because of that. And, um, you know, I went through extensive therapy. So like Portia said, finding that therapist, that is a must. Um, but I remember when they kind of gave me these diagnoses, right away I felt labeled. And um, I thought, this, this can't be me. I, I mean, I already told you guys, I have a background in nursing. And I thought, you know, when people have severe depression, in my mind, my picture of them was somebody who was just, you know, kind of like laying in bed and doing nothing and not functioning and unable to cope. And and I was going to work every day and I was taking care of my family and and, and I was, you know, doing what I had to do to get through the day. And um, through my own studies, you know, that's when I found that, you know, depression really is so different than what many people may think. And um, as, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Roger, um, uh, had talked to as well, um, you know, the labels, but we didn't go right to medication either because we knew that really a lot of my um, symptoms, you know, were situational. It, it came from the death of my son. And so we worked through um, different things. I did go through EMDR therapy, which I truly believe did help save my life because it did help me take them thoughts um, and from creating that emotion I used to have, I can now think about it, I can talk about it, and there's some emotion there, but it's like the there's a disconnect now, and it's almost like a file cabinet where um, that picture used to be right in front, and every time you open the file cabinet, it was there. And now I'm able to take it and put it in the back of the file cabinet so I can go in and find everything else and, you know, deal with coping. And so that's what, as Portia said, you know, we found out how can I cope with this and, you know, what do I enjoy? So I also had writing um, assignments and I had to write a lot of letters to um, different people in my life. But um, ultimately, I found that I just needed a little distraction. So I used uh, meditation. I used walking in nature and I used um, coloring and adult color books. And if my mind was focused on one of them, three things, I found that the anxiety would just kind of dissipate. Um, and you know, that, that just really was helpful. And I was able to get through uh, my grief, focusing on, I guess, distractions, I, I, I like to call them, um, where I was able to calm my anxiety by focusing on these other, you know, one of the three things. Um, well, and you, another thing that I know you have done is you've turned your grief and your greatest loss and struggle in your life into helping others. And, and that's like one of the most beautiful things we can do with our pain. Um, you know, I love you guys. I, I wrote down a list of things that I, I suggest to people when they're feeling in that dark place. And, and you guys have touched on so many of them. You know, Portia touched on finding your community. That is so important to find your people that love you unconditionally and that have that replace that negative voice in your head with a more loving, more empowering voice in your head. Um, the other one, and then Roger, you said have faith. 
you know, when you when you're going through life and you don't believe there's anything greater than just this this existence here, it, it's it's hard. It's easier to look at the world in a very bleak and dark way, you know. So like, what's the point? Um, another thing is, you know, finding your purpose, finding something you're passionate about. I think when you have something in your life that you are thrilled that you get to do, whether it's painting or your career or you know playing music or whatever it is, like that's the thing that's going to help get you through. So Roger, I'm going to go to you. What are your thoughts on those kind of ideas and notions? Absolutely. Totally agree. I mean, often we have to step back and we have to ask ourselves greater questions. Like what is life for? You know, why, why are we here? What is the purpose of our life? The more you are, you, the more you become disconnected from that, the more you'll focus on the, the pain of living. And you know, you talk about engaging in activities that are that are pleasurable. I do believe that one of the things that makes life worth living is to experience joy or to experience pleasure. And there's so many amazing aspects of life that uh, include love, that include art, connection with nature, social connection. All the things that make life beautiful are why we 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 live on this earth. It's why we continue to forge forward in the face of challenges. But like anything, there's a dialectical balance. So if there's love, there is loss. If there is pleasure, there is pain. And so both of those exist at the same time. And that is part of the duality of living. That is so true. And, you know, also too, we can't be happy all of the time. You know, there are things in our life that happen on a daily basis that can either, you know, destroy us or, or get us in that mindset where we really start, you know, spiraling out of control. And the same with me when I lost my son, I really had to come to this place to say, what am I doing here? What is my life here? You know, what is this for? And then, of course, in finding that helping others helps me as well. You know, it just takes away that mindset of doomsday and nothing's ever going to go my way again. You know, by in service, looking to uh, be in service of others really always is my key, my go to key all the time. And I want to add to that, too, Stephanie, we have to think about what would our loved one want us to do? They don't want us to sit up in the bed all day crying because they're no longer with us. They still want us to move forward with our life and live it to the fullest, like what Roger and Don alluded on, that duality in life. But that's where gratitude, gratitude is the key that really keeps us afloat to make that duality of life have balance, right? As I mentioned, my mom passed away two months ago. And that grief, and I might get a little emotional for talking about this, what I've found through this grief journey that I'm on with my mom transitioning is I've had to find grace. I've had to find a new meaning and purpose for my life. Am I going to continue to be a victim of my circumstance or am I going to find a way to become victorious in my life? And I know that my mom, she didn't raise no chump. My mom raised me enough to be able to stand up to the tough moments. She also provided me with that love no matter what. She said, always put love first. And so with me keeping that in mind through this grief journey that I'm currently on, I've learned to pivot my thought pattern around grief. I see grief as that open door of opportunity. When one door closes, plenty more open up. And I know that in our society, similar to how we have one narrative around mental health, oh, when you're depressed, you're supposed to be in the bed all day, but there's people who have high functioning depression and anxiety. It's the same thing with grief. Grief is any loss. Grief is not just the loss of a physical person, place, event. Grief comes when a friendship ends. Grief comes if an opportunity falls through. Grief comes, as in my case, when I relocated a thousand miles from my family, my friends, I, you know, there was grief within me wondering, should I have made this decision? So I think we have to, again, 
be open to shifting our mindset on the way that we view certain aspects in life and just always practice gratitude, hands down. Yes, I always say, you know, being challenged is inevitable, but being defeated is optional. Ooh. And that's going to be like that. where our mindset is on that. Sue, do you have something to add to that? Yeah. And so I was going to say, you know, with that helping other people and finding, finding your why and finding your, your, your passion. And, you know, I always thought I knew what I was going to do the rest of my life, et cetera. And you just never know what's going to happen in life. And, you know, with my son's passing and going back to school for my degree in sanitology um, and the purpose was to help people and, um, you know, finding that, that true joy and, you know, people say, well, how can you find joy after you've experienced such a tragedy? And for, as um, already stated, you know, and I know that my son didn't do this to hurt us and my son didn't want to see us all hurting. He, he, you know, in a sense, I guess, was just trying to end his pain somehow, but he, he didn't want us to hurt and he wanted us to go on. And I believe, um, you know, we talked about faith already, and I believe that uh, your power told me, like, this is what you are supposed to do. And so I joined many different um, community committees um, that um, serve people who have um, mental health issues and um, who serve people who, you know, may have suicidal ideation, et cetera. And so I became very involved there. I actually started a support group for survivors of suicide loss um, that I facilitate. And I became very involved with an organization called Bo's Heavenly Clubhouse, which is a nonprofit organization that supports um, parents who have lost children. And I became very involved there as well. And so having support groups, um, various support groups that I'm running, being involved with um, the community and helping others within the community, as well as I work very closely with American Foundation of Suicide Prevention and actually do presentations for them and um, host programs for them. And just finding and having that ability to help others and helping to normalize this grief and this tragedy and what they're experiencing um, and seeing like them say, wow, there is another part of life outside of debilitating grief that that is my joy, that mm. seeing that. You yeah. turned your pain into purpose. Yeah. It's so sweet. And yeah. also, you know, I would like to just ask Dr. Roger a little more on the medication because, you know, in my personal story, my son was put on Ritalin at four years old. And I know that that's way too young to put any child on medicine, but he was uh, diagnosed eight with ADHD, and so um, they put him on Ritalin, and he continued to take that for about probably 12 years of his life, and I believe that it didn't ever help anything as far as his depression or his anxiety or the voices that he heard in his head. I think that it only numbed out a lot of, of that, and I think that, you know, if we can just help get to the root of the pain. And, and start speaking with people more about what's actually going on inside instead of just placing them on medicine. So if you don't mind, would you speak a little more on that, doctor? Sure, Stephanie. I, I think the unfortunate reality is, um, you know, that we use this word medicine and that language, that word is powerful. It makes us believe it's medicinal. And it's part of my mission to be able to communicate to people what the actual facts are, what the truth is about these psychiatric drugs. It's not fair to call them medicine. They are drugs and drugs induce a physiological change and a reaction within the body. And when you're talking about something that is psychoactive in nature, you are altering the normal physiology of the brain. So you're actually inducing or creating a chemical reaction in the brain largely experimental uh, for human beings. The studies that are conducted on all the various medications or drugs that are brought to market are often short-term. The data is hidden by the pharmaceutical industry and the pharmaceutical industry funds the FDA. 
And there is a, a conflict of interest. People believe that if a drug is passed by the FDA and it's brought to market, that it is both safe and effective. And the truth of the matter is that, that they're not. Many dangerous drugs are, are brought to market. When it comes to psychiatric drug market, it's, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And a lot of the information that is marketed to physicians is coming from pharmaceutical marketing teams, and they are certainly not sound science. And so they're, the thing about drugs, it's, it, it's the diversity of human beings is drugs affects everybody differently. There are, there are drugs that somebody will take that will have no effect on them at all. There'll be drugs that someone takes that they'll interpret as helping them because it's numbing a painful emotion. And there are drugs that people will take. It'll make them want to kill themselves. It'll create akathisia. It'll create, um, it'll create psychosis. Uh, it, it will impair one's physical health, metabolic health. Ultimately, if you're talking about where we're going to be 10, 15 years ago, it is my prediction that people will not be on psychiatric drugs because the idea that our emotional distress is related to a brain illness has just not been able to play itself out scientifically and all research has been abandoned in that area. Even when you think about brain chemicals, as Dawn was discussing before, the complexity of them, if you take like serotonin or so forth, most of them are, um, they're generated within our guts. There's a gut brain access and it's, uh, you know, we're it's starting to advance ourselves to understand the importance of metabolic health and gut microbiome and so many things. And these drugs impair healthy gut microbiome. So it is ultimately, you know, my belief that the overwhelming majority of psychiatric drugs are harmful. There might be situations where certain drugs in a short term period uh, have some sedative effect and stabilizing somebody who's in some sort of episode, whether it's mania or psychosis or high agitation and, and stress, the short-term use of some psychiatric medication might be helpful. But that's where it, that's where it ends because anything where you start to travel plus, you know, past the short-term use of these drugs, it becomes really problematic and, um, and, and harmful actually. Yes. Thank you so much for that. And the fact that someone would go to the doctor and say, I'm having suicidal ideations, and then they put you on that drug that's going to actually cause you to do it. It just, I'll never understand that. Never. That, 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 that is, this is a whole topic that definitely we could spend hours on because I'm super passionate about that, working with kids for as long as I have. But um, <laughs> I, I wanted to, uh, somebody had said something earlier and I can't remember who said it, but um, what, another thing I think is really important is that we pay attention. Stephanie, you said, you know, uh, notice the thoughts we're thinking, but also notice what we're feeding our minds. What TV shows are we listening to? What music are we, are we listening to? What are the things that we're ingesting? What are we reading? Those things also contribute to our mental health and well-being. Portia, did you want to add to that? Don't go anywhere. The Soulful Conversations will be right back after this important message. Meet Dawn Earhart Witty, loving mom, author, international speaker, humanitarian, certified life coach, podcast host, and founder of The Beeline Products that offers life-saving support of impoverished children around the world by way of beautiful and extremely well-made inspirational merchandise, including lovely t-shirts, pillows, coffee mugs, soft warm throws, totes, jewelry, all natural skincare products, fragrances, and many more wonderful items that make great gifts as well as keepsakes. The best part of all is that $7 of every item purchased will help empower and lift children around the world so they may live their happiest and most fulfilling lives filled with meaning, kindness, and love. To support this amazing organization and purchase an item for yourself or a gift for a loved one, please visit thebeelineproducts.com today. Thank you. 
I, I wanted to, uh, somebody had said something earlier and I can't remember who said it, but um, what, another thing I think is really important is that we pay attention. Stephanie, you said, you know, uh, notice the thoughts we're thinking, but also notice what we're feeding our minds. What TV shows are we listening to? What music are we, are we listening to? What are the things that we're ingesting? What are we reading? Those things also contribute to our mental health and well-being. Portia, did you want to add to that? Because I know oh, you're saying oh. for this. <laughs> oh, tenfold. I am somebody who has what I call squirrel attention span. Okay. <laughs> like literally my attention span is like a gnat. It is so short sometimes that I'm like, what did I just do? So when you talk about the things that we ingest, we ingest things through our eyes. We ingest them through our ears. We, not, we don't just ingest things through our mouth. All day long in the society that we live in, we are bombarded, flooded with emails, podcast, social media. If we live in a noisy neighborhood like I do, I live in a main hospital chain. So literally I'm hearing ambulances, fire trucks, all of those things, sometimes eight, nine times a day, even to the time that I'm going to bed. Then you can't forget, I have two phones. So both of my phones sometimes will be ringing off the hook at the same time. And I'm like, okay, who gets to answer? Who gets the call? Sometimes I'll just put them both down and say, nobody does. So in the world that we live in today, where we are so flooded and bombarded, it's important to practice mindfulness and not have a mind that is full. I'll say it again, practice mindfulness and not a mind that is full. And what does that look like for me? I go on social media strike. Oh, it's Porsche day, y'all. That means I'm not going to be on social media. That means I'm not returning phone calls. I'm not answering messages. Portia is spending time in nature. Portia is taking down time to reflect because, and I think, Roger, you hit on it, and you did too, Stephanie, about noticing your emotions when you think about certain things. Sometimes my gut, my stomach will start to cringe with certain things. My wrists will start to ache when I start to become depressed, when I find that I'm starting to get anxious about something, I feel like I'm starting to breathe through a straw. So being mindful of those things, that's when I know, and even my dog, got to love our fur kids. I know we talked about it in the beginning, but my dog knows when mommy is not taking care of herself. He'll come up to me and start licking both my wrists like, hey, mom, take a break for me, please. Take a break for you. Thank you. And so what I really do is I disconnect myself from the mainstream world. So no emails, setting boundaries. That's another key part. I think in our society, it's looked at, it's frowned upon to set boundaries. It's frowned upon to say no, but no is a complete sentence. No means next opportunity. It doesn't mean that I have to be at your convenience 24 seven. What about me? You know, I have to prioritize my mental well-being. And let's be honest, sometimes no is both good for you and for me, because maybe you're not ready for what I have to bring to the table. And it's also a boundary for me to preserve myself. So it's really important for us to really practice that boundary of disconnecting from the mainstream, coming back home to ourself, whether it's through reflecting through journaling. I think you mentioned too about, uh, Sue, about doing art. Art is a form of expression. So really going in tune with ourselves and really practicing things that bring us joy is a way for us to really stop some of the madness that goes on in our life and to really be able to give us that platform and comfort of being happy in life. Because I think sometimes we have too much and we're not happy internally because we're under that veil of illusion that having too much stuff is what's going to bring you joy and happiness. But joy and happiness starts from within. And that takes us back to gratitude, Portia, like you said earlier. If we realize all that we do have to be great, we woke up this morning. I mean, that in and of itself is something to be grateful for. And we, we're we looking at the lack. I wish I had this. I wish I had this. Or I don't have that. And that also causes you know a, a place where we feel incomplete, unwhole, dark. Um, so, Roger, I, 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 I can't wait to pick your brain. <laughs> What do you think about, again, the music we listen to? I mean, what we're ingesting as society, you know, what kind of shows are on TV and what kind of shows are people watching? How does that affect our, our, our mental health? Yeah, where your, where your attention goes, your energy flows. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of toxicity that 
exists in our in our culture. And so when it comes to media, for example, their entire goal is to, to grab your attention. And how do you grab somebody's attention? You provoke fear and you provoke intense emotions. We're kind of designed that way. And so whether it is your social media or it's the news, the television news channels or anything that's kind of negative or divisive, where your attention is focused on, your emotions are going to be right along with that. And it's also going to skew your, you know, your viewpoint of, of, of people. And so you can look at well-established psychological studies that the amount of social media use or the amount of time watching the news is correlated very well with poor mental health and no negative overall well-being. And that does not surprise me at all. Sue, what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, I mean, I have to agree. And that's where I turned it around as well. And, you know, said, I have to find what brings me joy, not what brings me down. And yeah, you know, I agree with the social media and everything. Like, there's just so much, uh, what's it, just, just negativity um, with that. That you know, I, I I I do social media, but I really do not watch much TV at all. I am a music person, so I always have music playing, and I like um, my southern gospel music. Um, so that's generally what's usually playing, and that actually is, is what helped me get through a lot of my grief as well, because it just put me in a place with my creator that um, I knew he was going to get me through whatever it was that I was struggling with and he continues to. And when you talk about the gratitude, yeah, I definitely learned after my son passed, you know, one, well, how fragile life really is, but to be grateful for just the little things. And like you said, you woke up today. That is such a blessing because you know what? I have another day that maybe I can make a change for somebody, whatever it is. And it, it's not about me. It's about being given the the opportunities um to make a change a, a positive change and and it's not like you said about having the materialistic things anymore um and, and i'm sure stephanie can attest that you know the the little things don't matter anymore it, it's the connections that matter um after right. my son passed so yeah yeah and i always say you have faith or you have fear and you can't have both of them at once. You're either going to go towards your faith or you're going to be in that fear, you know, mind, mindset. You can't have both at the same time. So I'm always going to choose my faith over fear. Yes. I have a, that, a plaque on my wall with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that's what gets me through things. I remember when COVID first happened and they locked us everybody down. And I remember thinking, um, I don't want to be in a world where we have to socially distance ourselves. We can't to get together with our loved ones. We have to stay six feet apart. And I'm like, I can't hug people. Like I live for hugging people. I live for being with my children and my family. And so I'm like, I don't want to live in a world like this. And I just thought, you know what? everything this is my belief system everything happens for a reason there is something that we are to learn from this situation that is happening right now and i know everything is happening for us not to us so i'm just going to have faith you know that the that it's happening for a reason i don't know what the reason is sometimes you don't know the reason at the moment but when you look back in retrospect you can see that there was indeed some lesson or blessing in everything that happens to us so that is the faith part that gets me through any any of the the challenges or the dark places. So um, I wanted to let everybody kind of have a final final word about their thoughts on this, and then we can wrap up for the day. But I want to thank you all so much for being here. This conversation, I feel, has been so powerful. And like I say, on every one of our podcasts, I feel like I need to take notes because my guests are so wise and share so much good, valuable advice. So I thank you. Um, Sue, I'll let you start and then Roger and then Portia and then Stephanie, and then I'll close this out. Okay. Well, I guess in closing thoughts, I just, you know, I want to look at two different um, um, sides of the, the schema, I guess. Um, so for those who are, you know, trying to help others and are able to help others, um, my newest motto is together we can make a difference. So come together, be a listener, 
be an active listener and just reach out to people and just, hey, how are you doing today? I noticed something's off and, and not being afraid to ask some of them hard questions and sometimes just being in the moment, as we talked about, with others and letting them know you're there. But you know what? It's not about me. It's about you today. So tell me and talk to me. Um, and then on the other side, I want people to know that, you know, everybody is loved by somebody. Everybody is worthy to be here and everybody is needed in for something. And you are never, never alone. There's somebody out there that loves you and can be your person. So, you know, find that person. Don't ever feel like you're alone because you're not. Thank you, Sue. That's so important. Roger. Mm -hmm. So when you reflect back on the conversation today, there's a lot of what I call age old wisdom. And that age old wisdom is, it's around faith, it's around love, it's around community, it's around connection. The supporting, understanding and believing in the natural resilience of all people and that there's a evolutionary process that exists within our lives that's meant for growth. And where we have freedom, between events and our reactions to them tend to be around the mindset and the approach in which we think about it. So we are all kind of creators of our own reality. And this podcast today, this discussion was one of, of hope and inspiration. Many people have been kind of conditioned or brainwashed to think that there's a, a medicalization of human distress. There's a lot of fear provocation in our society along political lines, um, around our, our medical vulnerabilities, or just provoking fear uh, in order to sell you something. Resist that at all costs and make sure that all our listeners out there, that you stay kind of grounded in what makes life worth living. And that's some of the age old messages that we're discussed today. Oh, that's powerful. Thank you. Oh, to piggyback on the age old wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> I got to add this. The extra mile is never crowded. When you see somebody or hear someone in their plight, go the extra mile to be that person in their corner, because you never know how you noticing them could have saved their life. I also want to say this. If you're someone who's struggling, always remember that what you're going through is not permanent. Grief is a process, but it does not hold permanence. Mm, Portia, so powerful. Thank you. And I just would like to say, um, find your why and what you want to do in this life and get clear on that. Be definite on what you want. What do you want? What would it take? You know, I've asked people, what do you want? And they say, well, I just want to be happy. What does happy look like for you? Be detailed about that. And the way I start my day every day is I get out my journal and I write the things I'm grateful for. Because once again, we've all touched on that. We, if we're in our gratitude, then it's hard to see what we're lacking. So the same with faith and fear. If we're grateful, then we're not in that lacking state. And I just want to say thank you all so much for your wisdom. It's been a beautiful, beautiful conversation. And I'm so blessed and grateful to be here with you all today. Well, and I extend my same, that same gratitude to you all. You've all been amazing. Um, I meant to say this at the beginning of the show. I forgot, but I wanted to thank our listeners and our viewers on all of our platforms. A few weeks ago, Good Pods, we were rated number two in the top 100 self-improvement chart, uh, number two in the top 100 indie self-improvement chart, and number five in the top 100 indie education charts. So that was a complete surprise. I'm glad that our message is reaching people, and we want to have more these conversations to help people get through life's challenges so that we can be the change we wish to see. So thank you everybody for joining today and uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>